I'm Daniel Sawyer and I study Middle English literature. Uh, I particularly study texts from the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, that's the time often thought of as the end of the Middle Ages. Now, um, print wasn't used in England for most of this period. So investigating uh, literature from this time often means investigating the surviving manuscripts, handwritten books painstakingly copied out. And what you're looking at here is uh, the first page of the best surviving manuscript copy of the Canterbury Tales. And uh, if you want to see the writing close up, um, so here are the, the famous opening lines. Um, uh, you can see uh, Juan that April with his sure suitor, the drocht of March hath pesed to the router, and so forth. Uh, a time of year from which we are still sadly some uh, distance away. There are many manuscripts from this period uh, in the Bodleian Library just down the road. Some are very beautiful. Uh, here is a Latin index of names uh, in the Gospels, in one of them, with a really remarkably time-consuming large initial. Um, the image on the right is all contained in the letter R. Uh, so it says, Reverendissimo, uh, the most reverend. It's a polite, humble address to a patron. And uh, most of the manuscripts aren't beautiful. Um, uh, here's a, a, an ugly little book of English poetry um, with a cover made of spare parchment and the poetry is copied in rapid, quite squashed handwriting. Um, no fancy initials, no colours other than black ink. Uh, this, of course, has its own charm. And since, like any handwritten book, it is unique, um, it is in some ways just as precious as the finely decorated book in the previous slide. But my main point here is that there are many of these medieval manuscripts. There are about uh, 10,000 Western European examples in the Bodleian Library and then many thousands more in, in other libraries as well. Uh, the British Library in London has even more examples than we do in Oxford. So we have a great many surviving books, but we think that they represent perhaps between 2 and 5% of the medieval manuscripts which once existed. That means that perhaps 95 to 98% of the medieval manuscripts that once existed are gone. And therefore, in a sense, the most typical medieval manuscript, the default, if you like, is one which no longer exists. Uh, if my job is to understand what literature was like in the 14th and 15th centuries, then the most important evidence would be all the books that I can't examine because they're lost. So lately, uh, I've begun trying to work out whether it's possible to study books which don't exist, a research question which gets me a lot of funny looks when I attempt to explain it to my colleagues. Um, one route into the problem is uh, to look at little fragments of books which are otherwise lost. And here's one, set, uh, one of a, a, a set of examples, little strips cut from a lost medieval manuscript and used to strengthen the binding of a more modern book, so recycled as a physical uh, reinforcement. Now, uh, there's a whole set of these cut from one manuscript uh, across uh, a set of volumes uh, of uh, early printed 16th century books. And um, if you look very closely at them, you can learn a few things. So what you're looking at here, there's a few red smudges, which uh, you can see more easily in the zoomed in image on the right. And um, I can tell from this red smudge that there was a red colored large initial on the opposite page, which is now lost, and that some of the red pigment rubbed off when the book was closed onto this page. And that's the only way that we know that this manuscript once had large red initials. And of course, you can use digital photography to stitch such fragments back together. Um, but in a way, this feels a little bit like cheating because these are books which in a sense still exist in a small way. Um, what about the books which are entirely lost? Well, I think one way to uh, tackle those is to turn to the evidence of wills and catalogues and inventories. There are quite a lot of otherwise lost books recorded in documents of this sort from the 14th and 15th centuries. And scholars have combed through these um, for book titles to work out who might have been reading what. But no one has really explored their value as records of the physical characteristics of books, which are no longer with us. Sometimes what these records have to tell us is strange. I've found, for example, three descriptions of books which say that the, the book is hairy. Um, and the only reason I know what this means at all is that we have a very, very few surviving examples of book covers with the hair left on. Um, so this used to be a calfskin, 
and they didn't take all the hair off. Um, so those books would have looked a little bit like this. Sometimes what these records have to tell us is lavish and rather breathtaking and makes you really wish you had the book in front of you. Uh, there's a royal book, for example, which uh, was apparently covered with pale blue and white satin, lined with red satin and blue silk, with buttons of gold and silk tassels. Um, usually, however, what records tell us about absent books is, in and of itself, very brief and unhelpful. A book might simply be described as large or red, for example. And my solution for this, uh, my provisional solution for this, is to aggregate many of these short descriptions. Uh, so far I've collected 2,760 examples, which is not very many compared to the number, which are, uh, number of manuscripts which are probably lost, but it's not zero either. And using these, it is possible to imagine more precisely what it would have been like to walk into a library in, say, 1400. We don't have many surviving book bindings from the period, but from my evidence I can tell you that the, the colourscape of most institutional libraries would probably have been shelves full of books bound mostly in red or white bindings, for example. If they were bound at all, that is. Another curious finding is just how high a proportion of books were not bound, existing as bundles of leaves and gatherings, tied up or pinned together. So a writer's room at this time would almost certainly have been something of a chaos of, of loose material, um, not unlike my desk today, but sort of even more so. Um, strikingly, some descriptions of lost manuscripts themselves uh, are quite concerned with loss and deterioration. They record books which need repair, have become incomplete, or in one particularly amusing uh, Latin adjective which gets applied to a few books, they're falling to bits. Uh, there's even a body of surviving literature which actually thinks about this. So uh, this is a poem which <clears throat> imagines the destruction of the book containing it. Uh, and if we zoom in, you can see, uh, I hope, <clears throat> that it contains a blessing on anyone who repairs the book. So, uh, so this says, uh, But for as much that no thing may endure that earthly is, Alway, I tro certain. That's the first two lines. So, uh, because nothing that's earthly may endure, um, as I believe certainly, whensoever this book here after in scripture, either in covering, beginneth false again. So, at whatever point in the future this book um, uh, hereafter begins to decline, either in its binding or uh, in its uh, scripture, in its writing. Um, Although, uh, uh, although there too that diligence doth in pine hit to reform, be they on or other, uh, so all of those um, that uh, take care and work hard to repair the book, um, whoever they are, um, have they the pardon that Christ gave modline with daily blessing of father and of mother. So may all their sins be forgiven and may they have the blessing of, of well, maybe their father and mother, but also I think a sense of the generalised parents, the ancestors here. Um, so uh, I'm also beginning to be interested, I think, in, in the literature that thinks about loss from this period. And why does this matter? Well, on a larger scale, we're losing things all the time in a slow way, sometimes dramatically, as in the, the terrible museum fire in Brazil uh, last year. And we're set to lose a good, more th uh, a good many more things this century, um, things like coastlines and species. And I think this might be a good moment to think about past losses and about how people dealt with the disappearance of things in the past. And we're also living through uh, an unprecedented wealth of data. But most of the data that humanity possesses, publicly or privately, was generated uh, just in the last few years. And it relates to the last few years, not even to the quite recent past. Compared to what Facebook, for example, might know about some of you today, those who study culture in almost any period in the past are in the position I'm in with my missing manuscripts. Most of what we would like to know went unrecorded. So I hope that worrying away at this problem might one day have larger implications for the way that we think about the past in general. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>